Hey, everybody. Are you with me when I say life can be amazing at times, but it can also be extremely challenging? I know. I've been there myself. Learned some valuable life lessons along the way, and now I'm here to help you. It's no coincidence you found your way to the Relevate podcast. I'm your host, Rena Olson, a self-proclaimed inspirer of others. Together, we're going to dive deep into raw and honest conversations with real people. My hope is that through these stories, you too will be inspired and ready to tackle whatever's holding you back or breaking your heart. Then you'll be free to live a life of purpose and true fulfillment. I promise it's possible. Let's Relevate. Hey, friends. We are having church today on the Relevate podcast. I think this particular episode is going to really resonate with the men who are listening. Chad Bird had a big dream for his life that included becoming Dr. Chad Bird and teaching at a prestigious seminary. That dream came crashing down and he almost lost everything, including his life, before he made that one good choice. Listen to learn about the surprising turn Chad's life took when he sacrificed his big dream in exchange for his kids and a big rig. Chad Bird, welcome to the Relevate Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I appreciate it so much. So I love to tell these real life stories of hope, brokenness, and redemption. Thank you for being here today and your willingness and transparency to talk about some pretty tough times in your life. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself, Chad. Well, uh, I am married. My wife, Stacy and I have four children together, and uh, we, uh, we also are grandparents. We have two grandsons, which are, uh, which are quite a joy. Yeah, are we, busy. Uh, yeah we, we are. We, we live in Texas, right outside of San Antonio, been here for, for a number of years. We're both native Texans, so mm-hmm. this, is our, this is our home for good. Um, hey, and go Cowboys. I kind of have two different jobs that I do. Um, and well, I'm sure we'll kind of get into the, the background of that the more that we, more that we talk. But uh, during the week, uh, Monday through Friday, I'm a, I'm a truck driver. I work for a freight company in San Antonio. And so from you know, around 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock every day, I'm out uh, hitting the roads. And I drive a semi, so I'm uh, hauling big freight uh, here and there around the, the city of San Antonio. But I have a, another almost full-time job, mm-hmm. at least it feels full-time. Uh, I get up very early in the morning. My wife says I get up in the middle of the night. <laughs> to me, it's early in the morning. And that's when I, I write. I write articles. I write books. And then a lot of the weekends in the month, I, and in the year rather, I'm traveling around the country, speaking at conferences and congregations, and I'm involved in several different ministries, uh, in particular 1517, which is an organization that uh, is promoting the gospel in any, in any way that we can. So cool. I kind of divide my life, uh, at least vocationally, between, between those two, between truck driving, which keeps me very rooted to the earthy aspects of life to just regular people interacting with them and doing my job. But then I also am able to use my academic background uh, in order to communicate the gospel through my writing and through my teaching. That is so cool. I love people who have a career and do one thing, but then use the margin to do, you know, really what their their heart's desire is. So that's very cool that you're able to do both. Yeah, I found that uh, they... They really interact well with each other uh, because I'm able to. I d- actually draw a lot of stories that I communicate in my in my writings as well as in my in my teaching from just everyday interactions that I have with with people at work, whether that's customers or coworkers or I. My delivery area is in a pretty rough part of town, so I encounter a lot of people who are just kind of having a rough time, whether they're homeless mm-hmm. or, or struggling with something else. So. I have a lot of interactions with people, and those interactions have a way of encouraging me, actually, to keep on doing what I'm doing in putting the gospel out there. Yeah, and I would think those quiet stretches of time allow you to to really think and connect with God as well. Yeah, they do. Uh, I have a lot of time. I'm interacting with people, but I also have a lot of, uh, of time where just I'm alone in the cab, and 
that gives me a chance to yeah to, to think through problems to uh, to come up with with ideas on ways that I can communicate better to just reflect upon what Christ is doing in my life and in the lives of others so that that time alone I think is is crucial and and very helpful for being able to, to think through these very important issues that face us every day. Yeah, most definitely. So less than a month ago on Facebook, you wrote, this morning I dropped off my son at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. He's my youngest child. When I think back over the last 18 years, I'm especially grateful for one good choice I made in the darkest period of my life. It's made all the difference. Let's talk about the darkness and then that one good choice you made, Chad. Yeah, so uh, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll keep it relatively short. I was raised in a uh, very religious household. We went to church uh, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Uh, I was thoroughly part of, I guess, what you'd say is the Christian culture. And I went to, I went to a Christian college and uh, married a fellow Christian then went on to seminary, and uh, I did very well academically at seminary. And so while I was there, a number of the professors approached me about the possibility of me pursuing another degree and uh, coming back to teach at the seminary. So I went to, I left the seminary, I served a church for a number of years, and then the seminary uh, approached me about coming back to teach. So I, I agreed to that. It was actually exactly what I wanted. That was my dream come true. So I returned to, to my seminary, no longer as a student, but as a professor, and uh, was there for about five years. And that's when all my dreams were coming true. Uh, that's when everything also started falling apart for me. Uh, I uh, About uh, five years into into my seminary career, I, uh, I gave way to, to lust and I had an affair. And that led to the destruction of my marriage, destruction of my career, my job, my reputation, a lot of my friendships, and basically everything that that I once thought was was most important. Mm-hmm. And uh, I lost basically everything. So I entered into a a real dark phase that lasted for a number of years. I was angry at everything, mm-hmm. especially at God, yeah. and angry at life and struggling with depression and thoughts of revenge and flirted with suicide for, for a time. And it was, uh, it, was, it was during that period when I felt uh, farthest away from God and trapped in darkness and surrounded by shame and just attacked on, on every side, both inside and outside. It was, it was during that time that I made a lot of really, really terrible decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, that led to those years and during those years as well. But the article that you're referring to is uh, is the record of at least one good decision that I made back then. So I uh, I was living a few hours away from my children and uh, trying to see them as much as I could on the weekends or every other weekend. And I was attempting to carve out a new place for myself where I could teach at a at an institution. But I realized that if I kept on pursuing that goal, that I wouldn't be able to spend any time with my children. I would see them just very sporadically, and I wouldn't be able to be a part of part of their lives. And at that, at that time in my own life, the only light that I had were my two children, my son and my daughter. And so I made a decision, uh, or I guess the better way to say that is that God led me to that decision that he had planned for me. So I basically abandoned any any dreams I had of ever teaching again, and I went to a school and got my CDL so that I could be a truck driver, and I moved to where my kids were, which was a small town in Texas, in the middle of the oil and gas fields, where the really the only jobs were in those oil and gas fields. So I got my CDL, I got a job with a trucking company, and I started working in the oil and gas fields. My son at that time was about six years old, and my daughter about eight, so they're both still relatively young. Mm-hmm. And because I made that decision, because I moved to where they were, I was able to see them multiple times every week. Uh, I was able to pick them up from school and drop them off and have them over on the weekends. And we were able to spend a lot of time together as they were growing up. I was able to maintain that connection with my children. I wasn't just a 
you know, an occasional father, but I was there mm-hmm. for them as, as much, as much as I, as I could be. And at the time that I made that decision, it was very difficult because I knew that I was giving up what had been my dreams. I knew that I wouldn't be a professor again, which was what I loved mm-hmm. to do. But I knew that in the end, if I didn't make that decision, if I didn't sacrifice these career aspirations that I had in order to be a father to my children, then I would be giving up that which was most important in life. Uh, so I, as I look back on that, now that my, my daughter's 21, my son is 18, as I look back over those years, uh, I've never once regretted that decision that I made because it really has really has made all the difference in the world regarding regarding our relationship. We live in a different town now, uh, no longer that small Texas town, but we still live in the same town. Mm-hmm. I, they moved to where we live now, and I was able to transfer with my job, and I moved to where they were so that I could continue to be a presence in their lives. So it was um, several more years before I came out of that, that uh, dark period that I mentioned. But uh, those, even, though, even during those dark years, uh, God was able to, to show me his love through my children. And, and I think that through that love and that relationship that we had, he was at work to bring me back to himself as well. Ooh, that, is, that is such an incredible choice and decision you made and um, quite a contrast in careers going from a professor to a, to a truck driver. How did you, wh- what made you decide to be a truck driver? And that's a really good question. <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, when I, when I look back on that, it's, it's amazing how I can see the hand of God at work. I didn't at the time. Um, I was too angry at God to really think about how he was at work in my life. But looking back, I can definitely see that. So I was trying to finish up a PhD. When I was at the seminary, I was also working on my doctorate. And so I was I was spending my days preparing for my comprehensive exams for my PhD. And then at night, I was working loading trucks uh, for, for FedEx. So I went from being a professor in front of the classroom to to uh, sweating inside a FedEx truck for three or four hours every night loading boxes. And I I met I met a guy there, uh, one of my one of my coworkers who was about to retire from his full time job, and he was going to get his CDL and start being an over the road over the road truck driver. And I was at this point just trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do with my life because all I'd ever wanted to be was a pastor and professor, and I couldn't be either one of those anymore. So I was just, I was in my mid thirties and just trying to figure out what in the world I was supposed to do. And when he mentioned doing that, everything kind of clicked and I thought, you know what, I can do that too. I can, that will enable me, that kind of job will enable me to live where my kids are. It will give me the the possibility of moving it should they move because anywhere you go, there's a truck driving job. So I think that uh, God placed that particular man in my life who was going to get his CDL so that that idea would be dropped into my own head so that that would be the that would be the decision that I made. And it's worked out very well. I've been driving a truck now for just about 12, 13 years for a couple of different companies. And it's been a it's been a good career. It's been a stable career. And most importantly, it's allowed me to live and relocate to where I can be close to my kids. Yeah, and to to shift your priorities, I'd love to know uh, why do you think people, often men, are willing to sacrifice family for career? I think it all goes back to how we establish our worth and our identity. I can't speak for women, but I can. I think I can speak for most men in saying that men understand their worth, their importance, who they are, and what makes them just worthy of being, Mm -hmm. you know, someone who isn't just taking up space in this world, but who actually is here to make a difference, to make an impact, to have people look up to them, to have some sort of self-worth, all of those kinds of self-understandings. I think for most men, it goes back to what we do for a living. That is how we, that is how we come to the point of saying, you know what, I'm important. This is what I've done. This is my accomplishment. This gives me a reason to keep going because of whatever whatever it is that that job that job might be. And so, for a lot of guys, when they're trying to 
balance these two, work and family, or when they're making a crucial decision, whether they're going to choose career or whether they're going to choose family, a lot of times the temptation is so great to maintain that vocational sense of identity that they opt for work instead of instead of family. And my own take on that is that both those approaches are actually wrong. Whether whether we want to establish our identity with regard to family or want to establish our identity with, with regard to, to work, actually both those are misplaced. Uh, our identity is is completely and solely bound up in Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. And once we once we realize that that our worth and who we are and why we're here is completely connected to Christ, then everything else begins to fall into place. Mm-hmm. Then we don't turn to our spouses or to our children or to our accomplishments or to our work or to anything like that for an understanding of who we are and why we're here. Instead, we turn to Christ. And once, when we do that, when we understand that, as Paul says, it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us, mm-hmm. once, we, once we really get that, that that connection that we have to Jesus Christ, then everything else begins to fall in place. And we understand why we're a father, why we're a husband, why we're a worker, why we're a citizen and a neighbor and a son or daughter or whatever it might be. Because then once we realize that, that our identity is based in Christ by grace because of his love for us, then we don't have to seek it anywhere else. We don't have to always be pushing ourselves at work in order that we can feel like we're worth it. We don't have to live under a, a burden of, of guilt and shame because we're not being a good enough father or a good enough husband. Everything is bound up. When everything is bound up in Christ, then everything else finds its proper, its proper place. And I, so I think that, oh, that, that misunderstanding of identity could be applied across the board. It doesn't matter whether it's men or women, but I think with men in particular, that's, that's the, the siren song of finding our identity at work is that which calls them over and over again, instead of being rooted and identified with Christ himself. Yes, that. So I have a background, uh, had an incredible privilege to work for a men's addiction recovery center. And so many of the men that I met that were in treatment had father issues, whether dad you know, was completely not in the picture or dad worked all the time or dad didn't accept him. And I think the role of the father in the family is just so important. And that is in our homes is where we affect true life change, true world change, especially when our children and just you know, the worth that that decision made in your kids' hearts, that they were that important that you would sacrifice you know, such a big career for them, I think, oh, wow, they must be such solid human beings because of that decision you made. So I just, I think it's such a powerful example for other men to, um, you know, to really embrace what it means to be a true father. Yeah, I, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with regard to the importance of fathers. I, I was privileged to have a, uh, still have a, uh, just a wonderful father who, was my parents have been married for uh, going on fifty five years, something like that. Uh, and my dad was always a presence in my life. Uh, we're still close. Same with same goes with my mom. And I, I've told them before that that any any good thing about me can be traced traced back to them uh, because of their their positive impact in my life and how much they were able to to love me and guide me and counsel me and help me through, through all the years, Mm -hmm. especially, well, during my course, during my, my young years, but even when I was going through those dark years that I mentioned, my parents were always there by my side, always willing to, to help me and to, and to love me and to, and to guide me. So throughout my, my 49 years, they've, they've always, always been there and it studies numerous, studies have shown the importance of, of having a father uh, as if we didn't know that already but even the even studies have have shown the just how crucial it is to to have a father who's there to be that model for us be that one who we can turn to be the one who helps us be the one who models for us what it means to be 
to be a man, to be a husband, to be to be a father. So I'm I'm very thankful that I've had the opportunity that I've had to to be with my kids and to make a positive impact in their lives. And they've both done very well. Um, I'm extremely thankful for the decisions that both of them have made and the young people that, that they've become. That's so cool. And you know, our jobs are never done as parents. It is, <laughs> it is a serious true. marathon when you, when you have a child. Yeah, that is true. It doesn't stop when they turn 18 or, or 25 or, or even 45. Uh, they'll, they'll always be our kids and they'll always need something from mom and dad. And it just, course changes as, as time goes on but uh yeah. yeah parenting continues and being a child being a child continues as well those are callings that we live the rest of our lives yeah so in that article and I'm, i will definitely link it to the episode notes in there you said life is too short to dream big dreams what what exactly did you mean by that i think that sometimes when we focus upon that which is great and grand and big we get so enraptured by all of these, these, these huge aspirations that we have, that we miss out on all of the seemingly small things that are really the most important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that I'm just a, a living example of that. I had these huge dreams when I was was young and was full of ambition and full of pride. As some of those things began to, to fall into place, and all the while I was missing out on some of the most important things in life. Uh, like love of spouse and love of children and taking time to just enjoy what we sometimes call the simple things in life. And so I think the more that we, we focus upon, you know, conquering the world, the more we're actually missing out on what is really important in the world. We're so busy looking up that we forget to, to look down mm-hmm. at all the normal things in which are embedded the, the true riches of life. I mean, it, we, all you have to do is talk to an older person, maybe someone who's sick and near death, someone who's, who's got the perspective of looking back on the past and ask them what they most regret. And what they, what they usually are going to point to is the things they missed out on. They're going to say, well, I wish I'd have spent more time with my family, or I wish that I'd have been close to my grandchildren, or I wish I'd have done this or that, just kind of normal things in life, because mm-hmm. these these are the joys that God has provided for us. And yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with reaching high and, and striving for, for, for things that are, that are big. But when that becomes our sole focus or even our primary focus, then along the way, we're going to be missing out on the true joys in life and the things that are going to matter in, in the long run. That is such great advice. And I think also um, being present in those moments we, I think a lot of us are just so distracted and, um, you know, it's like when you're not fully present there with, with that person you love, you miss it. Oh yeah, absolutely. There, we, we live in an age that's addicted to distraction. It doesn't matter whether it's our cell phones or, or something else. We're constantly being pulled this way and that. And so it's hard for us to actually just be there in the moment and, enjoy our kid's birthday party without checking Facebook or enjoy a meal out with our spouse without uh, worrying about what's going on at work or checking our emails mm-hmm. or something. So yeah, actually being there, being fully present and immersing oneself in the moment, that is, that is actually a skill that we all need to, we all need to cultivate in this age of distraction. Everybody. And I think we all have a little, a little bit of ADHD. I mean, I think, I know it's a, a serious struggle for a lot of people, but um, it's just hard to, to maintain focus and be fully present. That's, that's something I really, I'm working harder on being there at that moment for any extended period of time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a verse in Exodus 24 where God tells Moses to go up onto the mountain. And uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a very short phrase there that's often missed, missed by us. Uh, it's usually translated something like, go up to the mountain and stay there. In, in Hebrew, it simply says, be there. Mm. Go up to the mountain and be there. And I've always liked that phrase because it communicates to Moses, I want you to go up to the mountain, and I don't want you to think about what's happening in the valley. I don't want you to think about what's happening on another mountain. I don't want you to think about your past. I just want you to be there. 
to wait for me to speak to you, to be fully present there, and not to focus upon all these incidentals, but to focus upon the, the main, the main thing. And so that particular phrase, I think, has a lot of meaning for us, too. Yes, I love that. So for many of us, it could be like we are sacrificing a dream when we have to let it go for, for whatever reason that is. But the dream you had may instead be marinating and transforming into something bigger and better than you originally imagined. Would you say that is the case with your life now? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, actually a great way to put it. Uh, where I'm at now, there is no way that I could have looked ahead and and thought, yeah, that's where I'll be in 20 years or 10 years or even five years. Uh, what The way that God has, has worked in my own life has led me to the point that uh, I, I just never – Never would have seen it coming. So I, oh, before I met my wife, uh, I was just kind of wondering from day to day and not thinking too much about the future because every time I did, the future looked pretty pretty dismal. And uh, when Stacy and I met and married, uh, things began to re- improve remarkably in, in my own life. And I started to, after several years of not writing anything, I started to, to write again and then a few teaching opportunities opened up for me so i began to do that and i got connected with organizations like christ old fast and and 1517 which we provided me with some more opportunities for for teaching and and preaching the gospel and then some lo and behold some publishers contacted me about writing about writing a book for them and so i'm at now where i never really thought that I would ever be because I'm able to be with my family and uh, I have a wonderful wife and I'm here with my children and at the same time I'm able to use my gift in a, in a new in a new and unforeseen way I've had countless people tell me over the course of of the last few years that if my life had not taken the turn that it had if I was still at the seminary and, and a professor there then I would I wouldn't be anywhere close to being able to to reach the people that I am reaching with the message mm-hmm. of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, undoubtedly the hand of God is, is in that because he was able to use everything that happened to me for an ultimate good. And what I thought was my dream, which collapsed because of my own sin, God transformed into something that's very different. Uh, but where I'm at now is, actually exactly where I want to be because I'm able to see how God is using my experience, especially my painful experience, but also my my academic background and my pastoral experience in order to shape me into a better communicator of the good news. That is so cool. So let's talk a little bit more about driving that big rig. Um, you mentioned you've written a book about that period in your life that continues today. And the book is called Night Driving Notes from a Prodigal Soul. What's that like, and how did it make you feel closer to God? Yeah, uh, I mentioned earlier that I I started driving a truck so I could live where my kids were. Uh, I got on with an oil and gas company, so I spent a lot of time out in the uh, what we here in Texas call the boondocks, just kind of (laughs) middle of nowhere at night, uh, servicing oil and gas wells. so I was alone a lot, and uh, it was at night, so of course it was dark, and it was uh, it was really during that time period when I first started driving a truck for those next two or three years that God really started working on me. I like to tell the story of one particular night I was stuck. Uh, it had rained, and I was down in a low spot. My semi got stuck when I was trying to come out of there, and so and when that happens, you have to wait for hours for a bulldozer to get there and pull you pull you out of the mud. Ugh. And I had a copy of the Psalms with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always carry that in my truck, and I started to pray through the Psalms. And it was it was that night as I began to pray just sequentially through a number of these Psalms that I realized that I wasn't in the cab alone. That uh, that the God I was so angry at, and that I was using these Psalms to to try and talk to was right there in the cab with me. He was listening, was loving me, and was was loving me back finally to to a full restoration. So that's just one one example of how God was able to use my time as a as a truck driver through his word to to re, 
to begin the process of restoring me, restoring me to himself. So I talk a lot about my journey in, in the book, Night Driving, and uh, use the parable of the prodigal son as an example of what happened in my own life and how God brought me back from that faraway country from feeding pigs and from wallowing in my own self-pity back finally to the house of my father and to the feast of forgiveness that we enjoy there. So driving a truck has been a challenge, uh, but a good challenge, and it's provided me with numerous opportunities for God to put things into my life that yeah, I never would have experienced before, whether it's people or experiences or lessons learned. So it's been a, it's th- that particular vocation has been very enriching for me. Very cool. In your official bio, you mentioned that you are devoted to honest Christianity that addresses the raw realities of life with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please help us understand more by what you mean by that. Yeah, I think a lot of times our Christianity gets reduced down to kind of these religious cliches. Mm-hmm. And we often give the, get either give the impression or get the impression that Christianity is for people who really have their act together, for people who are in the straight and narrow and minding their religious P's and Q's and just kind of this prim and proper etiquette-focused Christianity uh, for people who really are where they need to be. And this is just kind of a, another Christianity becomes just kind of another way for them to to help better themselves in life. And that's not the Christian. That's not the, the Christianity of the New Testament. That's not what Jesus came to preach. He 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 preached the kingdom of God who's coming to the lost and lonely and broken sinners who can't get their act together. That's the reason that he appealed so much to the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and why he was hated so much by the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because he was turning everything upside down. He was eating and drinking with sinners, as they accused him. You know, he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard, uh, because he put himself into the lives of those who were broken, who were lost, who were involved in immoral activity, who were kind of the social pariahs of the day. And that was, is really what Christianity is all about. It's about it's, it's about reaching all people, no matter where they're at, no matter how messed up they are, no matter how far astray they've gone. They have, we have a God who chases us down, who actually came down to earth and became one of us in order that he might win us back to himself. And people who come to church, uh, no, matter, no matter how, they, how, how nicely they may be dressed, you know, in their hearts, they're, they're wearing rags because everybody has something they're dealing with. Everybody has skeletons in their closet, everybody's dealing with some sort of shame or guilt, and we might hide it behind a nice smile, and a nice suit or dress, but we all know what's really going on. And so what we need in church is not some kind of pretend gospel as if everything's okay and all we need is a little bit of moral encouragement. What we need is Christ for us, Christ crucified and risen in order that we might be justified in the eyes of God that we might have forgiveness in life and salvation, and in order that he might put us broken people back together again by his grace. Mm. And so that's why I say what I do in my bio, because you will find a lot of very raw honesty in my writings. I'm, I don't hesitate to talk about my sin, Love that. And mistakes yeah. that I've made, because I want other people to have to have that kind of ability to be transparent and to know that they don't have to say the right thing to God in order for him to hear them. All they have to do is cry out, Lord, have mercy. And he's, he's right there having mercy on them, just like he had on me and he's had on countless other people who uh, have wandered away from him and broken their lives. He's there to heal and restore and uplift and love them back to, to hell. Yeah. And having him in your life is total game changer. And I think so many people who are away from the faith or who've never really experienced true relationship with Jesus don't don't realize they think it's about going to church or about a set of rules and regulations that they don't they don't want to follow but it's it, nothing could be further from the truth and i i really um, admire people like you that are just you know stripping it down and and keeping it keeping it real and um, easily digestible for, for, for people who are searching and seeking and want something more out of life. 
Yeah, I think it's it's safe to say that um, that the reason that at least some people reject church or Christianity, uh, I, I actually feel a lot of sympathy for that. If the reason they're rejecting it is because they see it as just one more bastion of morality or rules or regulations that they're never going to live up to anyway. Well, if that was what Christianity was, I'd probably reject it too. Yeah. <laughs> so I like to to remind people that Christianity and the work of Christ is not about just a whole list of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations. It's about finding our life in Christ and finding true freedom and true hope and true peace in him and living in that freedom that he's, that he's given us. So that's, that, that's what, that's what the gospel really is. It's not a list of do's and don'ts for us, but it's a list of, of accomplishments that Christ has done for us in order that we might be right with God and find that peace that comes from his spirit. So good. So I'd love to know more about 1517. What's that all about? Yeah, 1517 is an organization that was created a few years ago. And uh, with we have a, a pretty pretty sizable group of people that are either authors or professors or experts in apologetics or biblical scholars. Uh, and what we do is we have we have the website uh, 1517.org, which just by the way, which just came out today with a completely renovated and improved and just amazing site. So all. Cool. You mentioned in your note to me that uh, my website was down. Actually, what was happening yesterday was that uh, all of my content from my website was transferred over to this new site at 1517. So everything that I've written, uh, it's like I have about 450 articles. <laughs> and they're, so they are, they're all found there on, on the 1517 website now, uh, including the one that you referred to uh, at the beginning about uh, making the decision to be with my children. So they're all there now. And so I'm one of their feature contributors. And so we have we have free uh, academy courses. They're online. I taught one of those called Christ in the Old Testament. And we have, I don't know, eight or 10 podcasts. I have a podcast, a weekly podcast called 40 Minutes in the Old Testament. That's through 1517. We have an annual conference in San Diego in October every year at which several hundred people attend. We have uh, city events, and we're going to be opening up a few other kinds of conferences this, this coming year. So there's just a, a wealth of material there. And it's all focused on one thing. It's all focused on getting the gospel out to as many people in, in as many ways as, as we can. So it's a gospel-centered, Christ-centered organization that is just all about promoting Christ and what he's done for, for us. And Super thankful to be part of it. It's just a great, great group of people and uh, a great organization that's centered on the gospel. Very cool. Well, I'll definitely be checking that out. So it's amazing that with all this going on, you you have a new book out. How is that even possible? And this, <laughs> yeah. this book is called, like your wife says, you must never sleep. Up, <laughs> Upside Down Spirituality, the Nine Essential Failures of a Faithful Life. And the reviews are amazing on that book, Chad. I'd, I'd love to, to learn more about that book. Yeah, so the title itself, Upside Down Spirituality, is taken from, from the book of Acts, where Paul and his, uh, and his fellow travelers are in Thessalonica. And if you remember the story, they're, they're accused of, of causing all kinds of problems in the city. And their opponents say that these guys like Paul, who have been going all over the place, have come here now, and everywhere they go, everywhere they go, they're turning the world upside down. I've always liked that phrase because it's you know sometimes you're accused by your enemies of exactly actually the right thing. It's like their accusation is a compliment, and that is one of those cases because that's, that's exactly Good. what was going on. They yeah. were actually there turning the world upside Completely. down. Uh, so uh, so the, what the book does is it it takes nine so-called failures, at least they would be failures in the eyes of the world. And it demonstrates how actually these are successes. These are what it means to be faithful in the eyes of God. Uh, so it takes the wisdom of the world and it turns it on, it on its head so that we now see it upside down from God's perspective. And as, as I say in the book, it may be upside down from our perspective, but from God's perspective, it's, it's right side up. because. 
as you know, he's always turning things backwards. You know, Jesus will say the first, the last are first and the greatest is the servant of all and, and the least is, is the greatest. So Jesus himself is turning things upside down. And even in his death, he's showing the life of God. He's revealing the glory of God in the, in the gory crucifixion that he, that he under, underwent. So this is, this book was my way of taking, taking three aspects of our lives as individuals, uh, in our family and in our work, and then finally in the life of the church, and demonstrating how the wisdom of God is backwards from the perspective of the world. But it's the only way that actually leads us to a life that is that is at peace with God, and that is the way that He actually created us to live. Sounds so amazing. So, can you give it us an example of a failure? Yeah. Or do we I can. have to buy uh, the book? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of them is uh, the failure to follow our hearts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. very often we're uh, this is kind of one of these proverbs that we're that we're told to, to follow your heart, and and it sounds good. It sounds very like it belongs on a Hallmark card, and that would be fine if our hearts were actually in tune with the heart of God. But uh, the, when the Bible talks about the human heart, it, it doesn't have a lot of really positive things to say. <laughs> You know, the, oh. Jeremiah says the heart is a, is, is a deceitful thing. Who can understand it? And of course, Jesus talks about all the bad things that come out of the, out of the human heart. So rather than following our heart, according to the wisdom of the world, instead, we follow the heart of God. We follow the heart of Christ. And we find out what's written on that heart of God in his word. So by following his, his, his word, we might actually, in, in some cases, follow exactly contrary to what our heart would tell us to do. But in following the heart of God and following the heart of Christ, we actually come then to the place where our own hearts are actually at peace. It's, it, it's like a, it's a shock every time because when we start out following the heart of God in front of our own hearts, it might hurt. It might seem crazy and wrong. But eventually the Spirit brings us around and realizing actually this is, this is what's best. This is actually what brings us actually peace and, peace and hope in this life. So that's just, that's just one of the examples of, uh, of one of the chapters in there. And I've got nine of them listed in the, in the book. Well, I, c- I cannot wait to read that. That sounds just really so incredible. One last question for you. The word relevate means to uplift or inspire. What closing words do you have for our listeners as it relates to the amazing work you're doing? I would close with this, that I'm sure there's somebody out there listening right now who's in a dark place like like I had been and maybe in the future, who knows what, what life has in store for me. But the uplifting message that I would have is this, that in that dark place, even though you can't see it, even though you probably can't feel it, Christ is there. He is at home in the darkness because he's at home anywhere that his people are hurting, anywhere they're suffering, anywhere they're heartbroken. So no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, Christ is there with you. And he's there with you not just as a presence, but as a saving and a redeeming presence. And he will not abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will not turn his back on you, but he will bear you through the darkness and he will lift you through the pain and he'll bring you out into a place of of light and and hope again. And it might not be happening to you now. It might be happening to one of your friends or family members, or it might happen to you sometime in the future. But anytime we're going through those dark, dark periods, know that we have a God who loves us written our names on the palms of his hands and he will never ever leave us or forsake us but instead will do everything necessary to bring us to himself because there is nothing more important in the world than you to god Mm, and that is the good news for sure chad bird where can people find you and connect with you online i'm on facebook as well as twitter uh, you can search for me there. I've got a public Facebook page, uh, Chad Bird, and I'm on Twitter as well. And uh, then if you want to find my writings, uh, then you can go to the 1517.org website, and that's where all my material is, is now located. That is awesome. And I will link those to the episode notes. Chad Bird, thank you for being here and sharing just your amazing story and uh, the love of Jesus. You really brought it today. And I'm so, so thankful to have had this time with you. Well, thank, thank you for having me on. It's been a joy. Okay. You have a great day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. 
God's ways are so strange sometimes. Who could have ever predicted the outcome of Chad's literal fall from grace? His climb back up through the muck and the abandonment of his dream to become a professor. Instead, he chose his kids and a big rig. And in so doing, he found out they were the big dream. And with time, his heart healed, the pieces of his life came back together, and his preaching and teaching platform grew bigger than he could have ever imagined. Only by the grace of God. I leave you with this Chad Bird nugget of wisdom. The more we focus on conquering the world, the more we miss out on what's really important in the world. That's good stuff right there. I'm Rena Olson, and this is Relevate.